Q&A is taking a summer break and using this opportunity to dip into our Q&A archives. We'll showcase some of the year's programs you might have missed or might want to check out again. Host Susan Swain will introduce this week's selection. Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In this episode, you'll meet Ilyan Wu, author of a new bestseller, Master, Slave, Husband, Wife. She recounts the harrowing journey of self-emancipation made by two enslaved Georgians, William and Ellen Craft, in 1848. Disguised as a wealthy, disabled white man traveling with his enslaved servant, the Crafts left Georgia via public conveyances, successfully avoiding slave traders, law enforcement, and curious fellow passengers in their effort to gain their freedom. Becoming popular speakers on the lecture circuit, they found themselves hunted by slave catchers after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Ilion Wu, your latest book is Master, Slave, Husband, Wife, An Epic Journey from Slavery to Freedom. It tells the story of William and Ellen Craft. What makes their story particularly compelling to you? I can't even begin to say what it doesn't make it compelling to me. I mean, I've been obsessed with this story for a really long time. But I think, of course, what originally drew me to it was the phenomenal adventure story that they tell in their narrative, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom, which they published in 1860. And it talks about this incredible escape that they make. They are husband and wife, enslaved in Macon, Georgia. And they decide they're going to flee for freedom. And they do this not with any underground railroad, which doesn't reach all the way down to the south where they are, deep south in Georgia, not by hiding and um, traveling by night, but they go out in the full light of day, disguised as master and slave, with Ellen posing as the master and William playing the role of the slave. So that story just gripped me from the beginning. In their time, how well known were they? They were quite well known, actually. Uh, There's a quotation from Wendell Phillips, who is a a celebrated uh, abolitionist lecturer. He's called sort of the golden tongued man. And he's speaking in front of thousands when he predicts that future people will, you know, millions will read their story and know it with admiration and applause because many, many people across the United States knew their knew their names at that time because their escape was so phenomenal, but also because they chose to tell their story. Why do you think they fell from the pages of our history books? That's an interesting question. And I think some of it depends on which history books that you're talking about. And um, yeah, so actually I would probably quote Um, one of the craft's own great great granddaughters on this when she says whether people know the story or not has to do a lot with where they're coming from and what they have um, the kind of stories they have access to but it's certainly true that the crafts are not let's say known like douglas or tubman or truth people who are known now by by a single name and i think that reason is is complicated. It has a lot to do with which stories we decide as a nation. Um, People in power in this nation have decided to tell and remember over the years. It's also in many ways a difficult one for us, I think, nationally to remember because it has so many pieces to it um, because it's not, it doesn't simply end with their achieving their self-emancipation when they reach the north. Lots of things continue to happen to the point where they actually have to leave America. So it's not one that is easy for us to embrace. Doesn't have a neat and happy ending, in other words. It doesn't. It has so many endings. And that's part of what actually makes it so exciting in my point of view, um, and so rich and worthy and deserving of our attention, renewed attention today. Besides William and Ellen Craft, you mentioned uh, Frederick Douglass. Who are some of the other important characters in your narrative? Well, there are a lot of people, I mean, across the board from abolitionist lecturers, uh, black activists, uh, the president of the United States uh, who come in and out of the story. And one thing, I have a writing partner who I work with. We kind of like are like uh, 
like we actually used to be running partners and she was she, we'd always keep each other going and we we're kind of doing the same thing on the page and one thing that she pointed out was that it's like um you know in the ordinary movie you would have not the ordinary movie i guess an, a, a mainstream like hollywood movie that you might have seen over the last hundred you know, so last number of years you would have henry clay or daniel webster um or more recently frederick douglas at the center of the story and now these characters they get walk-on roles in william and ellen craft story that's sort of how i like to see them but so many of them come in and out so there's um there's Douglas and William Wells Brown, who are great lecturers, self-emancipated people who really kind of show the crafts, uh, the craft of telling the story and what it means um, to uh, to live a life in freedom in the North and overseas. There are the president of the United States and the secretary of state, Daniel Webster, who have to sort of figure out how they're going to try to help recapture the crafts. Um, there are international celebrities who get to know the crafts abroad. Um, lots and lots of people who go in and out of the story. And if you actually take a look at the book, the book jacket, and you uh, undress the book and remove this jacket, you will see that there are a lot of people on the insides of the pages. I don't know if you can see that, but these are some of the many people who you'll meet along the way. So the story opens in 1848, and you make the point that this year is a real seminal one in not only mm -hmm. American history, but globally. What are the important things that were happening in this country in 1848 that makes this a real uh, focal point of their ability to make the, the escape that they did? Well, 1848 is one of those sort of crazy years where so many things are happening. So worldwide, you have democratic revolutions sweeping across Europe. And those revolutions are being celebrated in the United States and cheered and toasted in Washington, D.C., for example, by people who are actually holding enslaved people in bondage themselves. Uh, meanwhile, you have this is a year of Seneca Falls, the international, uh, sorry, the, the American um, uh, Women's Rights Conference. You've got a um, it's a year of global pandemic with the cholera sweeping around. Um, you've got an, in, an information revolution, a transportation revolution. So trains and steamers and all kinds of technology are working as at, as never before to bring news and people across the country. You've got the close of the Mexican-American War and the Mexican Session, which just explore explodes the contours of the country. So and you've got Western migration, you've got the gold rush. I mean, it's a really, really intense an um, exciting time in the United States history. Uh, manifest destiny is a catchphrase. And that's why the crafts escape, I think, meshes so interestingly with this because they they harness all these revolutions that are at play and they make manifest a new destiny of their own. Approximately what was the population of the country at the time? That is a really good question. I don't have it at my fingertips, but it was definitely exploding and changing. And this is also a time when there are new immigrants coming to this country as never before. So even as the crafts ultimately leave the country and they're landing in Liverpool, Liverpool is one of those places where tons of impoverished people are getting on boats and coming over to the United States. Uh, Irish immigrants uh, following the potato famine, Chinese immigrants are starting to make it too um, with the gold rush and uh, working on um, you know, the railroads and mines and such. So our population is exploding and changing uh, at, a, at a dramatic rate. Do you know approximately how many enslaved persons were in the United States at the time? That's another good I, question. I, think I, I am not on top of the figure. No, no, I actually think you, I, I wrote down from one of the one of the paragraphs about three million 
uh, that one of your one of your uh, historical figures referenced. So we'll, we'll, yes. we'll use that that number from your that. your book. You also tell readers uh, we think about the fugitive slave law as something that came out of the Compromise of 1850, but you remind your readers that that George Washington actually signed fugitive slave legislation. So it had been enforced since the very founding of the country. What did that early legislation mean for enslaved people? What did it do to their lives? Well, both the fugitive slave law, the 18th century fugitive slave law, and actually a clause in the Constitution itself um, made it possible for or legalized uh, enslavers' rights to go reaching over state lines and reclaiming their enslaved quote unquote property or the labor that was owed them um, as it's expressed in the Constitution. But there were many states, especially in the North, that were getting around these laws and it was hard to enforce. So actually George Washington himself had a challenge with Ona Judge, who is the subject of a wonderful book called Never Caught by Erica Armstrong Dunbar. And so he himself never was able to recapture um, Ona. And enslavers were incensed by this because what's the use of having these protections for their property rights as they considered them when when somebody escapes let's say to boston which is seen as an abolitionist stronghold um you can't you can't legally you can do something but actually you can't so the craft's home was macon georgia what's important to know about macon in 1848 well macon was an urban center. There are lots of, you know, it's a sort of a transportation hub. It's right next to Milledgeville, which was then the uh, state capital, not Atlanta. And it was kind of a, a bustling, um, thriving place. Uh, the Indian removal uh, in Macon had dispossessed many Native people of those lands. And you can still see the Akmolgi Mounds, um, where uh, Native people used to bury their dead those grounds are, were cut through with railroads. And actually the person in charge of sort of supervising the construction of those railroads through those grounds was Ellen Craft's own enslaver, Robert Collins. So there's a real irony there of Ellen and William Craft fleeing on the same line that her, the man that she was forced to call master was in charge of uh, building. And those tracks were laid uh, by enslaved workers, and those helped her ultimately get to freedom. So let's spend some more time getting to know the two protagonists in your story, starting with William. So how old would mm -hmm. he have been in 1848? So he was born in 18, let's see, 18, eight, my math skills are a challenge here, 1823, eight, he was 25 years old. And what um, was known about his life uh, up to that point? Where did where was he born? What were his early days like? Yes, yeah, so that that was really interesting to discover because I did find out through his original enslavers' records that, uh, and then ultimately through his own death records, that he was born in the town of Milledgeville, and he was born to parents who he knew and who he loved, and he had siblings who he also grew up with. Um, he was enslaved by a man named Hugh Craft, identified just as Mr. Craft in the book, and this man is known as somebody who's invested in education. Who helps the poor, a Christian man who has some of the best pews in town. But as William points out, that there's a real, um, you know, this is a man who enjoys all these privileges and this reputation, but this is the person who's essentially gambling debts, um, if you call a sort of cotton speculation a kind of gambling, lead to William's family being ripped apart. And what, oh, tell me the story of William's family being ripped apart, sold at auction, mm -hmm. and how that affected him. Mm. This is the emotional, one of the emotional cores of the book. I mean, both William and Ellen's separations from their families, um, from their, William from his parents and his siblings, and Ellen from his, her mother. So William's parents, uh, he was one of the younger children, and um, they were laboring for Hugh Craft, and he saw uh, that they were getting old and um, past their prime. Uh, William's mother had already had all these children. Uh, William's father, they were both probably in their 40s or so, and so he wanted to 
as as the crafts remember it, sort of uh, replenish his stock by trading in these older enslaved people for younger ones. And um, that's the reason actually that he gives William when he asks, because William is under 10 years old, about 10 years old maybe when this happens. Um, and he asks Kraft and he says, because they're losing their value. Um, and so William remembers his parents and seeing them taken off and and sold off i mean by two two different enslavers what happens then is william and his siblings are left and his brothers are sold and then he and his one other brother and one younger one younger sister are remaining and the older brother and william are apprenticed um william to become a cabinet maker because he's uh, he's smart. He's if he develop, develops these skills, he will be, provide a return on his investment for his enslaver. What he doesn't know is that Hugh Craft is having more and more financial troubles, and so this is what ends ends up. This is what results in both William and his sister um, being put on a mortgage, which I actually held in my hands. You see them mortgaged uh, alongside. Uh, pianoforte and um, church pews and other stuff, other physical property, they are listed there um, as if they are things. And what happens is when, you know, the cotton speculation takes a downturn for um, Mr. Hugh Craft, the children, um, their lives are put on the line and they're sold off. And you d describe him watching his sister being led away in chains on a wagon and how, mm -hmm. how this made him so angry and that anger sort of coursed through him for the rest of his life. Can you add any more color to the story that I've just told? Yeah, I mean, it is, um, it's a devastating moment and it's, it's, um, it's, I highly recommend also returning to the original narrative where William recounts this. He feels this, uh, you know, this burning inside of him, this fire inside of him, when he can't even say goodbye to the sister. Um, and she, uh, he's seeing her as she's being pulled away. She's already tried to, you know, beg to see if he can say goodbye to her for a last time. Um, and he gets the no, and he knows that she's not going to be sold locally, but she's going to be going um, far away. And that is a moment that he will never forget. And it leads to him seeking his own self emancipation um, and also being determined not to replicate the cycle of trauma with his, within his own family, uh, not to have uh, children who will be, and other family members who will take it, be taken away from him in this way. So you said that William was uh, an apprentice to a cabinet maker, and this becomes an important part of the narrative because he seems to be able to earn his own income. How did that work? So this was actually technically not legal, but it was a really nice arrangement for for enslavers. So William's enslaver was a young man by by the name of Ira Hamilton and a, a businessman. And what William did was because he had these skills in the shop, he made this arrangement where uh, Ira Hamilton would pay a set fee um, for William's services to the cabinet maker. And then whatever sort of William worked on top of that, he, he made an arrangement with the cabinet maker so that he could earn his own wages. So he had to work a full day and have all those wages go to Ira Hamilton, but then, uh, sorry, Ira Taylor. And then, but he could uh, keep the other wages that he earned both at the cabinet maker shop and a hotel, which I think is also key because hotels are places where people are going in and out, exchanging information, traveling. Um, so that's another place where he could have picked up information about how to move in time and space. Turning to Ellen, she was a few years younger than William, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 17 or 18 years old, I think, as the story starts. What is her lineage? So Ellen was a daughter of an enslaved woman named Maria, who she was she had a really, really close relationship to. This is something that's remarked upon again and again through the ages. Um, and they were both enslaved by Ellen's biological father, whose name was James Smith. Now, James Smith originally had a house in Clinton, Georgia, which is, um, you know, maybe like 12 minutes away from uh, from downtown Macon, they eventually end up moving back to Macon, moving into Macon. Um, but 
James Smith has a legal wife in his household, and they have a number of children. Uh, and his wife, uh, Eliza Smith, is so enraged by the sight of this child, uh, Ellen, and her resemblance to her biological father and her being mistaken for a child of the family that she wants to get rid of her. And at the soonest opportunity, when her own daughter turns 18 years old, she has Ellen given away as a wedding present to become the property of her ha Ellen's half-sister. So she and is this, the, the so-called house slave of her own half-sister? Exactly, exactly. If she were standing in front of us today, what would we see? Mm, if, if Ellen Craft yeah. were, mm -hmm. were sitting, that's, so well. So she was the, short, or uh, how light complexion, what did she look like? She was very fair. Um, I have a picture here of her in her um, older age that I, keep on my desk. I don't know if you could see this. We can, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, but um, so she was very fair complected. Um, she had uh, dark straight hair as described. Um, she was, everybody talked about how lovely she was. Um, she's, both she and uh, William were known to be good looking people um, and very charming and graceful. Um, she, she would have been dressed, she would have worn a corset in her day as a as a house slave. This is something I learned. I have this, a wonderful friend. I mean, one of the things that's really exciting about this kind of research is talking to other people who have different areas of expertise. I really wanted to kind of bring the era alive with like the foods and the smells and the costumes and all these kinds of things. And I have a friend who is a real expert, um, Lynn Bassett, with these kind of clothing details. So she was able to let me know how a woman like Ellen would have dressed and she would have had a corset because back then, uh, have you, you know the expression, a loose woman? Mm -hmm. That comes from women who didn't wear corsets. So if you were gonna be a respectable person, um, that includes women who, uh, enslaved women who are working as house slaves in these households, you would be wearing a corset. So she'd be wearing a corset, um, a full skirt, uh, and um, possibly a kerchief on her head. Um, but she would have been wearing clothes, especially in her case, because her enslavers didn't want her to be mistaken for white or as a member of the family. She would have been dressed in a clothing that marked her as an enslaved woman. So William had a skill of being a cabinet maker, but Ellen had her own specific skill, that of a seamstress. She did. And how important, yes. what, how important is that to her story? That was also critical for a number of reasons. One is because as noted, she was small. Uh, and so when you have to, so when William, William is the one who actually goes to the different shops in Macon and he buys a hat and he buys the coat and he buys the vest and he buys the shoes. So all these sort of, um, a jacket would be too hard would be take a lot of work to to make in four days which is all the time they had um she made her own pants because pants that's something that wouldn't be able to fit and even the other clothing items when she turns tries on the pants uh sorry when she tries on her vest over the outfit you know even william is looking at her like um i don't think this is going to work he kind of panics there's a there's a newspaper that recounts him recounting this so he looks at her and he thinks that this this can't work but she is a clothing expert so she knows that even though the vest is off she can layer her clothing in such a way that it's going to be all right so that knowledge as well as the uh sewing expertise both help her essentially in 1848 when they make their escape how long had william and ellen been a couple in terms of their marriage, uh, they had they had had this uh, slave marriage ceremony um, in 1846. So that was two years, but they had fallen in love before that. Uh, they had fallen in love, but Ellen had not wanted to marry, um, not wanted to have this kind of, um, you know, profound um, connection with another human being, knowing that this person and any family that she created with him um, could be stolen from her at any time. So in fact, 
even though they fall in love earlier, um, the their their relationship is delayed. They think originally that they're going to try to run first and marry later, um, but it the escape routes prove to be um, so out of reach that they decide to reverse the order and put love first. You said that they pulled their plan together for this daring escape in just four days. What was the urgency? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a clock that starts ticking. Um, and I guess I should back up for a moment to say that in order for them to even initiate this escape, um, they had to get written passes for their from their enslavers, giving them permission to move in space. So as an enslaved person, you cannot you cannot travel without such a pass, and there are severe punishments for traveling without this written pass. The sli the, the the crafts were um, denied literacy, so it's not like they could forge one of these passes on their own. Um, and these passes were quite the, the ch your chances of getting one of these passes were going to be greatest if you were favored and if it were right around the holidays. That would be the time when. Um, you might be given a couple of days off. Both William and Ellen Craft were favored by those they um, uh, those who enslaved them, and so Ellen goes to her half sister enslaver, and she says she gives an excuse. Um, this is before Christmas, but it's also she gives an excuse that her uh, aunt is ill, and. Eliza at first doesn't want to spare her because if even if this is the holidays, it's it's you know it's a busy time at home, um, and Ellen bursts into tears. And at that point, Eliza, Eliza gives her that permission, but she's she both she and the cabinet maker who signed the paper for William give them just a few days. So that that gives it the urgency of them getting out of reach within that time. So explain the heart of their plan. How were they posing uh, and what was their destination? Mm -hmm. So they were posing as a, Ellen was posing as a wealthy white male enslaver. And she pulled this off with a sort of actually kind of subpar outfit. I'm going to uh, quote my friend uh, Lynn Bassett again here, um, because the, 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 the jacket wasn't custom fitted to her. Everything was a little bit big, um, but she had the performance skills to be able to give the impression of being um, being this man of class. Um, and of course, having an enslaved person with her also gave her that stature by comparison because she was a master, because she owned another human being. It sort of gave her a higher status. William, meanwhile, was going to be uh, Ellen Crafts or uh, I should say, um, William Johnson's uh, right-hand man. Ellen had added actually a crucial element to dis her disguise, which is disability. This is something they came up with at the last minute. It was Ellen's idea um, that she would put her arm in a sling and she would put poultices on her face and she would wear glasses, not only to hide her expression, but to give her the appearance of being um, an invalid and thus somebody who needed all the more to be served. So William would wait on her sort of hand and foot to make sure that she was okay. And that that need, that bond would be sort of built into their relationship. I know I was reading this through 2023 eyes, but as you described the, their disguises, it, it almost felt impossible for me to believe that they pulled it off uh, mm -hmm. be because, uh, the, I mean, the poultice, the arm sling, the glasses, that people weren't questioning it all along the way. How did they do it? Well, you know, it's funny because there are people who thought she looked a little weird. Like they go on the steamer. This is one of the sort of kind of creepiest chapters because we have an eyewitness account from somebody who had this kind of strange feeling about them. Uh, he noticed that there's this young man who kind of looked maybe Spanish um, and kind of had a strange way of walking. Uh, and he had his eye on, on them all along the way as they're steaming from um, Savannah to Charleston. And he's a uh, he notices and somebody else notices with him and by the end that person says that person um, is either a woman or a genius so they're not entirely undetected i mean um but that was also pretty early in their journey and they learn 
fast. They learn what's expected of William as, as Ellen as a master, what's expected of William as a slave. And this is really, it becomes all the more important because you had asked before about what what how they had planned their journey. They were supposed to go from Macon to Savannah by train and then Savannah to Charleston by steamer. And then it was just supposed to be one shot from Charleston all the way up to Philadelphia. There was supposed to be a steamboat going that way, but that doesn't happen. And instead they have to take this really intensive long journey with many, many more stops. And they have to constantly improvise their roles. One other aspect of uh, their escape uh, plans, and you say that William carried a gun. How was an enslaved man able to find a gun to carry? That is an excellent question. And that was actually one of those moments in the in, in when I was researching when it just kind of took my breath away because they don't mention having any kind of gun in their own written narrative. In fact, there's a lot that they don't say in their story. And so these things would come up and uh, really kind of turn the story in a whole new direction. And where I found this was in a late 19th century legal case where William is under oath, and this is about something entirely different, and he's describing what happened. So in their narrative, uh, when they land in Philadelphia, they get to a uh, friendly sort of abolitionist um, uh, boarding house. And the way they recount this moment in their book, it's almost kind of comedic because they get there and uh, they go upstairs, they say a prayer, they come back down, uh, and then the boarding house uh, owner says, actually, when they come down, Ellen is now, when they go up, I should say, when they go up, Ellen is disguised in her, is still in her disguise as, as a gentleman. They come down, she's had a costume change, and the, uh, uh, the boarding house keeper is completely bewildered, and he says, to William, you know, where's your master? And William says, this is my master. And he says, no, I, where's your master? It's him. So it's a kind of like a, almost like a slapstick moment. Um, and then suddenly, and then finally the, the craft say, this is who we are. Actually, what I found in this later newspaper account um, was something really different. In this account, Ellen goes upstairs and William pulls out a pistol and he lays it on the table. Uh, he shows it to the, 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 um, the housekeeper and he says he reveals who they are and he basically declares his willingness to use this weapon which he's had with him presumably on his journey where this weapon came from is is a mystery really uh, definitely in macon they th this would have been if they had been caught with them with a weapon like this it would have you know they would have lost their lives for sure so we don't know um, but it's amazing to know that they had that sort of as a last resort on their journey. Your book has a map of their journey and it, mm -hmm. it, it demonstrates that it is both arduous with so many changes of transportation conveyances and perilous, so many risks for them along the way, physical and also security risks. And I'm going to invite our viewers to read this because we, we really have only 30 minutes left in our conversation and it's lots of, uh, lots of interesting detail. But w when they got to Philadelphia, they were on free soil. Why did they just not stay in Philadelphia? Philadelphia was dangerous. I mean, they ask, they say, are we safe here? Um, because they're as soon as they arrive, the boarding house keepers, like the abolitionists, are going to want to know about this. So they bring in all these activists, and um, there's excitement about their story. And their original plan, actually, uh, is to go to Canada. Um, but they're not, Ellen especially, is not physically well, and they're thinking of staying um, for a little bit. Um, but uh, it's not safe because Philadelphia is still really like it's next door to the South. There are kidnappings there. Um, there are they're still very much in danger. So their next destination is what, if not Canada? Well, so the activists say, you know, Canada is really cold, so you probably don't want to go there. Um, and, but they actually also they want to send the crafts to Boston. Boston is known as sort of this a uh, hotbed of raging abolitionists by by the slavers. Um, it's a place where there are there's a strong black community and neighborhood where they physically can be protected. If you go there now, right next to the African Meeting House, you can actually see still these like alleyways where people can sort of go in and out. It's been described as a honeycomb. Uh, 
it would be really hard to physically get them out of that neighborhood. If they in Philadelphia re, uh, revealed themselves to the abolitionist community, did the word start spreading immediately? You talk about this as being an age of communication about their story. Did people, it, did it spread, begin spreading far and wide at that point? Absolutely, because this was, I mean, as it is today, it's a great story. Uh, they were, you, I, I've been sort of following these different activists as they're, you know, they're, it's almost like you can hear the whispers through the, through the letters, like, did you hear this? Like, um, have you heard of this, like, incredible escape? It's like nothing I've ever heard, I, I've, I've ever seen. So people are writing back and forth, and news is also traveling across the country uh, because they encounter this man named William Wells Brown, who's a self-emancipated man, a great storyteller, lecturer, uh, anti-slavery activist. Um, and he writes a letter uh, to William Lloyd Garrison telling, telling them about this couple. And that letter is published everywhere. So we think about, you know, it, like instantaneous news communication now. There was a feeling of that too, because the telegraph had just been in invented. So all of a sudden you have news from one part of the country and it's almost instantly in another part of the country, which could be great if you wanna share the news, not so great if you're people like the crafts and basically you get a mark on your back. But it, when uh, the Boston period of their life, it, it's hard not to be struck by how brave they were. They mm -hmm. made the decision to live their life publicly there, not to stay in hiding. Mm -hmm. Would that have put them in constant danger at that time before the fugitive slave law or was it fairly comfortable for a while? I think there was a bit of a lull and the way you get that sense of a lull is the fact that if you look in the Boston city directory for that time, William Kraft has advertised his services. Like, so basically he's in the phone book. Um, he has his address there and they also address his work in, in the Liberator, which is also widely disseminated. So it seems that they must have had some sort of level of security there. Um, in the neighborhood that they were in this honeycomb neighborhood but in fact of course they weren't and some of it also might just i mean their personalities they, they were incredibly uh brave people and they were just basically saying you know here we are william uh, wells brown is on the lecture circuit and invites them to join him on the mm -hmm. lecture circuit. Can you give our viewers a sense of what the speaker circuit was like to society at that period of time? Mm -hmm. Well, so William Wells Brown, uh, Frederick Douglass, of course, were two of the biggest speakers that were on this circuit. Actually, the lecture circuit was something that was very popular um, across a lot of different subject areas. You had people like Emerson and uh, Daniel Webster and others like having these Lyceum lectures. On a cold New England night, it might be something that you want to do. You're like stuck indoors. It's kind of like uh, entertainment on some level, um, uh, also a way of learning, um, educating, and being educated about various subject matters. Um, and for the anti-slavery movement, it was it was key. It was key to getting the word out about what slavery was actually like, because there are all kinds of reports that um, that slavers are sending about, oh, you know, enslaved people are actually much better, better off than people in the North. This is something that Ellen Crafts and slaver actually uh, says and writes down. So having real life um, eyewitnesses uh, of 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 human bondage and speaking to those experiences is something that really moves uh, and activates crowds. And at this time, actually, Sojourner Truth, she's another uh, another speaker. She was really just getting started. Uh, Harriet Tubman in 1848 was still enslaved. You didn't have women um, on the circuit the way you end up seeing Ellen Craft. So the Crafts, on top of joining this sort of lecture circuit phenomenon, were adding something very new. And it also provided income for them, I would presume, because people paid to attend these? They did. They could. They, they didn't normally 
charged like ticket sales, but they had a, um, you know, a basket, a collection basket that went around. So they were leave, living a somewhat comfortable life and then everything changed with the Compromise of 1850 and specifically its provision about the new fugitive slave law. How did mm -hmm. that change the circumstance for the crafts? In every possible way. I mean, this was a devastating law. It meant that the slavers were angry and uh, determined that the North would be, would participate actively in the return of fugitives and be good on their word. So what this did was it enabled um, enslavers like the Collinses, uh, like Ira Taylor, to either go themselves to the North or send proxies. And these proxies, upon identifying enslaved people or people that they are claiming to be enslaved people, uh, like the Crafts, they can have U.S. commissioners bypassing uh, local state authorities, have U.S. commissioners make this judgment. And these commissioners actually get paid twice as much if they uh, if they find that these are fugitives versus non-fugitives. And these so these people can also um, raise a posse. Um, they can have they they can require the the participation of the marshal. Um, I mean, they they have what Ibram Kendi has called octopus powers now. Um, they're they're completely muscled up and authorized to be able to claim people like the crafts or even people who might be mistaken for the crafts. The crafts have no ability to sort of testify against themselves. Sorry, against their their enslavers. And actually, in the case of the crafts, they they're so well known that um, there's not even a question of identification. Um, so this is a cataclysmic moment in American history um, when the South is saying to the North, show us that you stand behind this law. And it becomes even bigger for the Crafts because Ellen Crafts enslaver, Robert Collins, decides that he wants to make this a test case for the nation. So whereas the crafts and slavers have not taken action before this, even as they were traveling all the way across the country and really kind of embarrassing um, their enslavers in Macon, uh, even as they were living in Boston, again, um, and they could be identified as being there, the enslavers didn't take, they didn't do anything. This gets them uh, fired up and determined to prove to all of America that the crafts could be re recaptured and that slavery would therefore go on. He hired someone by the name of Will Willis Hughes to capture the crafts. How did the community in Boston around the crafts respond to the efforts that Hughes was making? Mm. Well, Willis Hughes, he actually travels together with a partner, John Knight. So John Knight worked in the shop with William and so he could identify him. Willis Hughes had experience with Ellen Craft's family. Um, it's said by one report that he had actually um, brutally physically punished Ellen's uncle um, to the point where the uncle was near death. So these men were, you know, they meant business um, when they came up. And of course, they had all these rights. They had the Fugitive Slave Act. They had behind them, um, they could raise this posse. Every good citizen, anyone they called upon uh, in, in Boston would be required by the terms of this law to help them. So I think they probably think that this is not going to be too bad. They arrive at their hotel. They can find William right away. They know he's like a, they know that the crafts are a 20 minute walk away. Okay but they encounter resistance. They encounter resistance on many, many different levels. First, with um, with the legal authorities who they're going to, that kind of takes its own comical turn. And then with ordinary citizens of Boston who stand up, down to the newsboys who are like, uh, not sorry, newsboys, street boys, who are said to be uh, throwing rocks and expletives at them. Now, you said that for Ellen's former enslaver, Dr. Collins, and he was a physician, mm -hmm. by the way, people should know, and he was also a unionist, and this was mm -hmm. an important case for him to uh, help preserve the union, to uh, enforce the fugitive slave law. But why ultimately did it involve Secretary of State Daniel Webster and the President of the United States in their case? Yeah, 
I mean, this is where I think you do kind of have to read the story because there are so many plot twists that are really beyond believing. But it becomes what's been called kind of like a, a cat and mouse game because the crafts go into... So they stand up um, and a lot of people stand up with them and then they dive down and they are zooming back and forth to different hiding places uh, and then the the make and jailer and uh, and his partner also sort of trying to chase them meanwhile um they themselves are getting harassed because one of the one of the techniques that the the crafts activist friends take on is that they try to keep these guys busy so these guys are you know in frustration there's you know smoking and then they get tapped with they get um you know charged for smoking in the streets or carrying a gun or and and or uh ridiculous things like um, running the tolls. So there's all this like crazy going back and forth and there's such a level of frustration and building up and the stakes are so high that Collins in, frust in extreme frustration turns to the president himself and says, look, you've got to do something about this. What was your uh, assessment as a historian and writer of, of Daniel Webster's role in all this? Daniel Webster is a really, really interesting character. One of the ones that um, I really, I can't say enjoyed getting to know in this process. He's he's a difficult person to know, um, but you know he's somebody who is is known for his powerful, stirring, beautiful words about liberty, um, and he was a leader through so many different kinds of compromises um, in our nation. Uh, he was able to work across party lines. But in the end, he was Secretary of State. So he he is in the Senate. Um, he doesn't actually get to vote for the Fugitive Slave Act, but he does speak for it. He becomes sort of um, the voice of the North that uh, that changes the tide. And as it's as one historian has put it, when Daniel Webster gets up to to say that the North has to support um, the South on this Fugitive Slave Act um, and the compromise must be passed, that's the point at which civil war in our nation um, is averted for the time being. So this is a man who embodies so many different contradictions personally as well, and I go into that in the book. There's some actually scandalous things um, that that he uh, experiences personally. Um, he's balancing all this within his own life. Um, and then he's trying to create this balance for the nation. He ends up as Secretary of State being in charge of really having the crafts captured and being returned back into bondage. And he's absolutely ready to do this. So it becomes... Uh too dangerous for the crafts to stay in Boston any longer, and their next stop through Canada is England. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of life were they able to create for themselves in England? England was a other, it was a really interesting step to follow through with this book because, you know, once they land there, then they're physically not in the same kind of risk. And then there comes the question of how are they going to live their lives in freedom? And you start to see them. Um, I start to see started to see them evolve as their own independent characters. They're not always together. They're not always working together as a team. Uh, William Wells Brown has this kind of almost like there's like this bromance chapter where he and William Wells Brown are going off and speaking and seeing like Edinburgh and all these like amazing sites and, you know, rallying crowds. So there's that, there's that, there's the, there's the lecture circuit that they go on, which takes on whole new dimensions in England. Um, but then there's their longer lasting desire to have a free, family um, and to have an education that requires some settling down so they do that um, but it's a it's a it's another it's a whirlwind journey it was a lifelong goal for each of them to have an education how did they finally get one mm -hmm. well they have an opportunity to to learn to study at an industrial um, uh, agricultural 
and um, educational cooperative under the auspices of Lady Byron and also her daughter, uh, Ada Lovelace, who's known now as like the world's first computer programmer. So they have this incredible estate uh, where they're, they're educating mostly children and the crafts go there, they teach their skills and they get to really sit down and learn, learn to read and write. They've had little bits of this up until this time, but this is really the first dedicated time. And in fact, you can see a letter that Ellen Craft writes just a couple months after their arrival here. And her letters, I mean, you can see her artistry in her hand are just beautiful. They're exquisitely penned. Um, they write this letter back to America. And you can see the pride in, in the formation of these letters, which are really um, moving for me to hold as a record of their movement in, in, in time, Ellen's hand moving across the page in time for us to see today. So they had no opportunity to return to the United States as long as slavery was legal. Once the war was over, what were their decisions about where they wanted to live and why? Well, that's the thing about the craft. So it's again and again with all these different endings, they could have stayed in England um, and lived comfortably there. Uh, they could have come back to the United States as they decide to do and settled in Boston, which would have been a great place, an easier place for them to be. Instead, they make another difficult choice of going back to Georgia, back to the South, originally to South Carolina to start an educational and farming cooperative of their own. Um, they encounter trouble there. Um, you know, this is, we're looking at late 19th, uh, 19th century America, and after the Civil War, it's not like there's happily ever after in the South. They have people who are really angry um, and don't want uh, formerly enslaved people, um, black people owning property and um, and uh, voting and doing all kinds of things there. The crafts did that, however, they built their school when it when night riders came to burn it down they built another one so on and on again and again they were pursuing their own version of the american dream one aspect of the story and i think it was during their british years that that we haven't told is that ellen was able to reunite with her formerly enslaved mother how did that mm -hmm. happen and how did it work out for the two of them that's again where you have all these networks um reaching and stretching across time and space. You have Ellen, so her husband, William actually is in Africa at this time, so this is a whole nother chapter, um, but she learns where her mother is and she can't, even after the Emancipation um, Proclamation has been declared, she can't get to her mother behind enemy lines. Macon is really buried in one of sort of the last bastions, um, Confederate bastions that are standing, but she knows that her mother is there. And she, she activates a whole network of people to be able to find her mother who turns out to be living not very far from where Ellen herself was living on Mulberry Street in Macon, Georgia. And this general, this union general, uh, has Ellen's mother, Maria, brought to him, says, you know, your daughter is looking for you. Um, are you willing to go? And she is, of course, absolutely ready to go. And there is this incredible moment where she's at the railroad station and this is the same line, if not in the exact same place, as the one that Ellen and William took themselves out of bondage. And a journalist describes, like, loud were the plaudits of the Negroes. Thousands of people were gathered there to see Maria off, knowing that this mother was going to be reunited with her child again. Um, that, to me, was like, a, yeah, a, one of those moments I'll never forget reading. When the Crafts published their own book, uh, which it would have been in the 1870s or so, how was 1860. It, how mm -hmm. was it received? So it was received well enough, I believe, to have another printing, but you know, it's almost like they published too late. The big narratives had come out in the 40s and 50s. Harriet Beecher Stowe had written a story that had sold really well, obviously, and had kind of a 
tangential connection to their own. William Wells Brown had written a novel, Clotel, which also uh, sort of took on parts of their story. By 1860, we were we were so close to civil war, and they didn't have this sort of like. Uh, best-selling uh, runaway success that that William Wells Brown had, for example, or Douglas many years earlier. But if a reader today were to pick it up, is it is it uh, accessible to contemporary readers? Is it readable? It's a one. I mean, it's what excited me and drew me into the story myself. It is definitely very readable. So we have about four minutes left, and I, and I guess to wrap this up, I, I found a, a sentence or two that you wrote that I'd like to have you talk about a little bit more. You write, mm -hmm. the absence of a happy ending may partly explain why the crafts are not better known. Their story eludes easy celebration, resists closure. Yet it is precisely this complexity that remains the source of their enduring power and why their story needs to be studied and celebrated. What were you thinking as you wrote those words? I was thinking how much we are in a unique position today to be able to embrace all the complexities, all the ambiguities that were so hard to discuss in those times, and they remain difficult today. We're li living in a time of a lot of dissension and tension. We're living in a time when people are trying to tell different kinds of American stories. And I think what the craft story does for us is it gives us an opportunity to see sort of the simultaneous trends in American history coming together through them. So we have the Declar Declaration of Independence. We've got that those notes being sung anew uh, by black activists, for example, after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, saying these words should apply for us too. You've got them retelling American history in ways I think that rhyme very much with uh, new approaches to history that we're seeing today. I think for us as a nation to be able to behold the simultaneity of all these different things in our culture. Um, the bad, um, the terrible history that we have with slavery, but also the heroism of people like William and Anne Craft and all those who stood beside them. We can have a fuller picture today uh, of America and um, embrace it through their story, I think, as never before. And maybe that's a way of adding a new chapter to this unfinished story um, that they bring to us. It's the story of William and Ellen Craft. Ilian Wu is the author, and the book is titled Master Slave, Husband, Wife, An Epic Journey from Slavery to Freedom. Thank you so much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. <laughs>